and uh, I'm really excited to welcome all of you to the Wedge for another Dig FM and to welcome Wim Decorda from Salian as our special guest presenter. And I'm also really excited to share something I've been working on pretty much since the beginning of this year. Um, and that is kind of changes we're making, plans we're making and changes we're making in the FileMaker community online. And I did a session on this at DevCon, but you're the first not at DevCon group that's gonna get to see this. Um, I did a post in the community yesterday where I shared some of the survey results from six months ago. And then I'm gonna be following up on that with a little bit more detail about the roadmap over the next few weeks. And so I'm gonna be short and sweet so that we can hand the baton over to Wim to talk about server and whatever else he's planning to talk about. Um, but first, this is a fun picture from DevCon. We had a photo booth at the party. Um, and I don't know if you all recognize <laughs> the two guys standing behind me. Yeah, it is Mark Baum and Matt O'Dell, and they were the FileMaker community leaders before me. So we just had a little fun with the crazy photo booth. Not seeing your, not seeing your screen. Oh, sorry. There you go. Can you see it now? Yep, things are back. OK. So that is all that. That was DevCon fun. Um, By the way, we almost filled up all our spots here. We went up one spot. OK. Um, so now let's give a little history. And I think this, is, this gives us some of the organic growth. And I, this growth is by, both why the community kind of is the way it is and is the kind of confusing, occasionally confusing rabbit holes that it has. So back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was no concept of FileMaker community, but what we did have is um, the Clara Solution Alliance and then the FileMaker Solution Alliance Tech Talk and Biz Talk email lists. And so that was the or origination of um, what is now the community. I mean, then in the mid 2000s, we built TechNet, and that was in addition to the FSA or then FBA, and that was a paid subscription, and that got you access to the for to the community forum and other other benefits. And at the same time, we also had a separate set of forums for for, that were run by our technical support organization. So we had the support forums, and then we had TechNet. And I don't remember exact timing, but sometime in the 2011 to 2014 timeframe, we merged the support forums with TechTalk or TechNet and had the FileMaker community and launched the FileMaker community. Um, and so the community, registration is required to post. All the content in the community is public with a few exceptions. And that's where we are now. And during all those merges and migrations, we didn't always think about good information architecture. I'll be upfront about that. Um, and I will also, you know, cop to FileMaker didn't always communicate those changes very well out to the community membership. Um, so that's part of why I'm trying to share the roadmap to like give people a broader glimpse into what's coming and also hopefully start to get a little more insight from all of you, suggestions, et cetera. Granted, we won't ever be able to do everything everybody wants, but we're trying to do as much as we can. Um, fundamentally, this is our kind of Found, this is this is what drives me every day when I think about doing things. Um, when I think about the community roadmap, and that is, we want to make the FileMaker community into the best place to find FileMaker development answers. Both you know the the forum style question and answer, um, and also great tips, techniques, code snippets, free resources from the community membership.
And so to get to that vision, what we've been working on for the last year, or since, since the beginning of this year, is um, early in the year, we did an outside audit. Um, we did some, we had the survey, I did member interviews, and we brought in a com community consulting firm and had them do an independent assessment of how do we measure up against both community best practices and peer software companies. So got the results of that audit. Happily, we landed about where we thought we would. Um, and then we took the results of that audit to build a strategy. So there we did a little more diving into the survey data to get to what do members want from the community and what, again, what are best practices and what can we do to make the online FileMaker community experience better for everybody. And so then we've taken that strategy and started to build it into a roadmap. So the first thing, and I think I said this in the blog post yesterday, if you've read it, this will be a repeat. And um, we kind of have three segments of members. We have people who've been newcomers, the newcomers, they've been members, they've been using FileMaker for fewer than three years. They've been members of the community for one, one to two years or less. Um, fi primary profile of these people is FileMaker development is not their full-time job. So they're learning FileMaker, they're building something to make their business life better, but they have another job. Um, on the other end, we have veterans or experts, and they've been using FileMaker for more than 15 years and have been a member of the FileMaker community, TechNet, et cetera, for 10 or more years. And predominantly in that group, FileMaker is your full-time job. And then in the middle, we have a group that is a mix. Like if I look, if I segment out that group from the survey results, you know, you've been using FileMaker for about as long as you've been a community member, and that group is split almost 50-50 between people for whom development is a full-time job and for whom it's not a full-time job. And so we're trying to figure out how do we optimize the experience for, for these segments. And I think here, more graphics. I didn't, uh, I forgot I had more slides here. You know, so again, like you can see that first, first, first chart is 77% developing FileMaker applications is not a full-time job. And I have a few fun quotes pulled out of the free text on the survey. You know, generally, finding information is a challenge for this person. And like level of answers sometimes are too advanced for the level of the person asking the question. You know, and this, this was called out as a recurring theme. Newcomers want to be able to ask beginner questions without having their heads bitten off. You know, so, and that's, you know, one of those things that I think some people are really good at answering questions at the level of the user and politely, and there are, but there are definitely members who say, have you searched? You know, or some, some variation on Google it. And again, now looking at the veterans, 70%, Developing FileMaker applications is a full-time job. Most FileMaker Business Alliance members and lots of time developing FileMaker applications every week. You know, so this is what are what do you want more from the FileMaker community was the question that this is in response to. You know, how do I get to things more quickly? and improve search are what I take away from that. Um, this is how do we grow the community. You know, let's get more people identifying as FileMaker developers. And more access to our development team. So that turned into this 
strategic plan, and this is kind of, I apologize that it's a bit of an eye chart if you're here at the wedge, um, but we really have three strategic goals. Um, one is customer success, and when I say customer success, I mean, it means developer success. So at whatever level you're at, are you getting the resources from the FileMaker community that you're looking for? You know, can we help people accelerate on the path from being new to FileMaker to becoming an intermediate developer to getting certified to identifying as a full-time or professional FileMaker developer and then ultimately to being a partner if that is what that individual wants. Um, next is onboarding. How do we better, as a community, help new people to the FileMaker platform get to success quickly? And finally, the customer support and customer feedback areas that we have now. So we still need a place to report product issues. We want to keep that ideas forum. You know, I've heard from our product management team repeatedly that is their preferred method for getting input on the product. So we need to maintain those functions as well. And so, you know, what does that turn to tactically? Um, you know, for that developer success arm, that turns to how do we improve the signal to noise ratio? And how do we make it easier to find whatever it is you're looking for? Um, can we provide more access to FileMaker staff via the community? How do we make the platform easier to navigate for the where the community is? And what can I do or what can we do to encourage community members to share good material, whatever that is, be it an answer to a question or I don't know if anybody else saw it this week, but one of the guys from MSN Media up in Portland shared a new theme that he calls more enlightened because he doesn't like the enlightened theme. So he went in and made a prettier version of the a still really lightweight theme and called it more enlightened. Um, so how do we get me, how do we encourage people to share those things when they have them available? So for onboarding, um, how do we build the sense of mutual support among people who are new to the platform and help people over that first hurdle of asking a question, not getting their head bitten off, and not feeling like they're walking into a cocktail party that's been going for 20 years? You know, how do we, how, how do we as a community do a better job welcoming new people in? And so tactically, what that's going to look like is we are going to be beefing up a newcomer area. So for the last nine months or a year, we've had a forum called New to FileMaker, but it's not super obvious that that's where we want newcomers to go. Some people find it, some people don't. Um, so let's, you know, my goal is to make a better navigation path so that people who are new to the platform find that first. And then doing some, some things with newcomers as they onboard, invite them into a smaller group of people who are at the same learning stage as they are so that they can work together and get, you know, ask questions of each other and ask questions of our MVP mentors to help get from that success of, okay, I just downloaded the trial or I just bought FileMaker. I want to see if this will work for me. I want to build something and put it into production. So let's like help people really get through that first project in a more supportive and more collaborative way. And then, as I said, we're going to keep the same, um, same avenues for feedback to FileMaker from the community. That's a big plan. That's a lot to do. And there's no way we can do it all at once because every one of these requires a lot of investment up front and then some additional time and staff investment to sustain them. So we're rolling them out kind of piecemeal and slowly. But here's a calendar of kind of where we're, where we're going, where we've been for the last couple of quarters and where we're going. You know, so on that first step, we have the newcomer area. We're working on ways to direct people to it more efficiently. Um, and we're working on the mentor, building out some mentoring with the current expanded team of MVPs. The other thing we did is we've grown the MVP team, and that's something we're going to continue to grow annually. 
for the for the next few years. Um, and working on improving the signal to noise ratio. So I think part of that for expert developers is going to be you're going to start to see those newcomer questions, hopefully starting to be more in the new to file maker space and less in the main discussion. Um, and we're also with the expanded MVP team and our internal moderation team working harder to enforce the few rules we do have. Um, so my ask to all of you is if you see things that you, so take, take five minutes later today and reread section two of the community terms, terms, in, terms of use um, and you know, think about those as you're making posts. If, and if you're reading in the community and see something that you think might violate those terms, use the report abuse action in the community. Just flag it, that will get sent to our moderation team and we will then make an evaluation of what action, if any, needs to be taken. And so if we do a better job, I think, of calling out the unproductive contributions as a community, if we all model the behavior that we want to see, that will go a long, long way toward improving the signal to noise. So my ask to everybody is to, to help with that. This is the big one and the one I have been mired in meetings for uh, with Jeff and Jimmy and several other people from FileMaker this week and probably most of next week as, all, as well. We have made a decision to change platforms. We will be migrating a good chunk of the content of the current community to that new platform, all the members, everything. Um, starting, we're starting that project now and we expect to go live late in Q1 or early in Q2 next year. So that's a big lift and it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna be a lot of work, <laughs> but I'm also really excited about it. It's giving us a chance to really you know, take a step back and look at the information architecture and the site map and think about, okay, we've had this organic growth for the last almost 10 years. So how do we improve that? How do we make that better for everybody who comes to, to the community to get answers and to help other people? So that's coming. So over the next several months, I'll start to be, you know, publishing about what's coming, what you all can do to help get yourself ready, to help get us ready, to help streamline the content migration as much as we can. And then we'll also be doing some early testing. So there may be some invitations to come in and kick the tires of the new platform once we have it up and running. So that's the big change that's coming. Um, and then once we have that, I think a lot of the other things that are on, the, on that roadmap that we're looking to do will be easier. You know, next thing, like around launch next year, we'll be doing some more, some more work to encourage people to share, share your, share your best stuff, and we'll have probably have some formal processes and challenges around that. That's something we're still figuring out what we're going to do and what that's going to look like. And definitely, we hear everybody that you all want better access to FileMaker staff. Um, the big challenge is we have a really small staff with really aggressive project product plans that you'll hear, hear a lot more about next week. Um, and like the directive I have from man senior management is you can do pretty much anything you want, but don't bother the engineers until sometime later next year. So yes, we hear and get that you all want better access to FileMaker engineers. And I have a lot of engineers who would like to be able to participate more in the community as well. But they just frankly don't have the bandwidth. They have to do, if, if given a choice between having engineers participating in the community or building really great products, um, which which do you take? I'm we're we're 
as a product driven company, we're falling on the, firmly on the side of our engineers' first job is to deliver the great products and platform that our community relies upon. So that's what I've got. Thank you, everyone. Questions? All right, I will try to answer what I can. Um, uh, the hyperlinks, uh, that, that's like a lot of things linking between documents and yeah. outside, so question, outside systems linking into the community. Will those all break on the new platform? So the question is, how are links, what's going to happen with links into the community and links within documents in the community and all of those things? That's a really good question. Like we are seriously, we are in the technical discovery phase of this project right now. So those are all things that are on our things we need to think about, but like I don't know what I don't know about that platform yet. So that's something we need to, we, we will be exploring and figuring out. I know from a standpoint of things outside the community linking in, where we control that, we have plans in place to make sure that those links still resolve. Um, but you know, if you have something on your website that links to the community, um, that may or may not like those links will probably break. So I mean, we're, we'll do what we can, but we're limited in the num like like the we're limited by the platform in the number of things we can redirect, number of URLs we can redirect. Well, right. Well, so we will build a translation table, but we're limited in the number of lines that table can be by the new platform. So we will do what we can, but I don't guarantee that every single thing will continue to work the way it, the way it works now. Any other questions? I can pop them up here too. Ah. <laughs> so question about any way to get a dump of all the old content. I don't know that that's possible. Um, for one thing, just simply because of the volume of content. I saw a thing where you could export ideas. Yeah, like that's a community manager function. Um, so. I don't know if we'll be able to do a dump of the, all the old content, um, but we do plan to move most of the content. I can't promise we're going to move all of the content um, because frankly, I don't know about any of you, but do you find being able to search for things like FileMaker 7 best practices useful? <laughs> like, Are those something that clutter up your search results or are those something that are actually useful? So, well, so we may, we may make a decision to, I'm not sure where we're gonna draw the line, but we will go back some number of products, some number of versions before what is currently supported and, and possibly draw a line in the sand somewhere and not move anything before that date. Can you do a report on the things that have been wiped? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I can, I can look at things like, what content gets lots of traction in search results and make sure that that stuff is preserved. Um, but, you know, we, we have some limitations in what we can do. Um, so another question is about training materials. Um, and are, the, are there plans to deliver better training materials? And I think that depends on what you mean by better. Um, we are always working on expanding the offerings, the training material offerings we do deliver. Um, but the other thing I will say is those are primarily going to be continue to be in the same format as the Custom App Academy now, in that they're a mix of video and text, short videos and text with maybe a sample file. Like we, we will not, um, we, we do not have any plans to revive like long form, big printed books like the FileMaker training series. All right.
So the, the, there's an observation from Vincent that direct discussion with engineers could save a lot of hours figuring out under the hood stuff. I mean, and those are the kinds of questions that are best escalated if you escalate those to our technical support team um, by either flagging TS Gal or TS Platypus or making sure you're posting those in report a product issue. Those are get eyes on them by our technical support team and where needed, they will escalate to engineering and be able to provide a response back. And last question that I'm going to take before I hand it over to Wim is, are there plans to enhance ideas to incorporate feedback from the product management or product development team at FileMaker? And I think the answer to that right now is no. Um, but again, because of resources, the volume of ideas is really high. Um, so we may not be doing direct feedback in ideas, um, but we do, over the course of the year, share the roadmap when we can. So we have, next week, we have the pro product roadmap webinar. Um, so if you haven't registered for that, please do. If you can't make it on Wednesday to those sessions, we will be recording it and publishing the recording and also updating the long form product roadmap document. And then in the spring, We'll do another preview webinar with the, the look at what's coming in the next version. And we have launch. And then every year at DevCon, of course, we do the, the session with product management and engineering. That's the peek under the kimono of what's, what's happening in the labs. And some sneak peek demos of that. So while we may not be giving that feedback directly in ideas, we are getting that feedback out a few times a year. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to turn it over to Wim. Thank you, Rosemary. All right, so let me give you. All right. Um. We only lost the idea. Thirty full-time Pomica developers uh, spread across three offices: one in Philly, one in Chicago. Um, one here in San Francisco. Um, so that, that's what I help run, help mentor, help grow the talents that we have um, at Soliance. Um, I've lived and worked all over the world. Um, there's a rumor going on that I want to run for something. Um, I don't know where, where they get that idea from. Uh, I actually currently live in Canada for the second time, uh, but I was born and raised in Belgium. Um, I've spoken at many DEF CONs, uh, and invariably my topics have to do uh, with server. Uh, I talk about server, I talk about the APIs, I talk about integration. Uh, a lot of what I do in the community, a lot of what I do in my project at Solion has to do with integration and server. Um, a lot of people come to us with questions about my, my solution is slow, can you help us fix it? Um, it's surprising how many calls like that that we get and then we try to figure out, okay, what's, what's going on, right? Uh, we look at the server, we look at the solution, and we try to figure out what can we do uh, to make that better. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And I want to keep it as interactive as we can, so feel free to interrupt um, any questions. 
Eric, if there's a pressing question that comes up, uh, feel free to um, raise your hand and, and yell about it. Um, so we'll go through that. We'll talk about what are the typical potential bottlenecks that you will face when you deploy your FileMaker solution on the FileMaker server, and, and how, do you, how do you keep track of that, right? How do you know if you're hitting one of those bottlenecks? And, and once, you, once you're hitting, getting hit in a particular constraint, what is it that you can do uh, to alleviate that? At the tail end of the session, I'll go into um, the data API, uh, some of the stuff that I talked about at DEF CON. Um, I really love the data API, and there's some really good stuff that, um, that you can do with that. And I want to share you some of the stuff, some of the fun stuff that I showed at DEF CON, but also uh, a real world example of, um, of what, what doors that opens and, and why um, I think it's, it's a bit of a silent revolution. Uh, the stuff that we have been given in FileMaker 16 with insert from URL, all the curl options to reach out from inside FileMaker, but on the flip side, reaching back into FileMaker uh, through the data API. All right, um, so if we're talking about FileMaker server um, and deploying your solution, right? Why should we care about a server? Why should we care about the deployment of our solution? Um, and I'll tell you a story of my first solution that I ever deployed, but I want to paint the backdrop a little bit. If the green arrow is the useful life cycle of our solution, right? And let's call it five years, right? You develop something and it'll, it'll run for a couple of years. So your client will get useful out of what you build, right? So let's call that five years. Typically, what we as developers focus on is, is, the, is the, the little bit at the very early stage of it. It's the development, right? So we, we concentrate on how do we develop what the client wants us to do? How do we capture the requirements? How do we translate them given the tools that FileMaker has? And how do we put it all together, right? So um, the tables, the screens, the scripting that, that holds everything together, the workflows, business requirements, all of that stuff. Now, during the course of our deployed solution, things will happen to it, right? Uh, the, the client will put more load on it, the server will crash, the power will go out, um, things will happen. Um, and, and that, that's why I think we should care, because for the client, the client isn't interested in our development phase. The client is interested once it's deployed, once they can use it, once they get value of the money that they paid you to develop it, that's what the client cares about, right? The client looks at that whole length of the green arrow um, and, and because that's where they get their value from, right? If anything happens to that solution while it's deployed, we as developers are at risk of, of uh, it's a reputational risk, right? If the solution is slow as soon as you deploy it, or um, the client doesn't get the uptime that they want, it keeps crashing, the server goes down um, a day every week, it all means that the client doesn't get the value that, that, they, th that they thought they would get it. And it may, be, may not be something that you can control because you focused on the development phase, but still, they're gonna say, well, I'm not calling that developer again because whatever he built for us it doesn't hold up or FileMaker is crap and they will just dump FileMaker and move on to something else which in, in turn affects us, right? And that, that's why I think we should care. I got bitten by that very, very early in my career. Um, I came to FileMaker in the mid 90s. I was still living in Belgium. Um, before I discovered FileMaker, actually I'd like to say I was for FileMaker was forced on me. Um, <clears throat> I was doing all of my development work in Access and VB6, a little bit of VBA uh, and Excel and all of that stuff. And I went into a new customer, uh, which was going to be my first big customer, a uh, small airline uh, out of Brussels in Belgium. Um, and I did my whole pitch. They, they wanted to have something where they could schedule their pilots. This was an ad hoc airline, not no scheduled flight, anything like that, just ad hoc. But they wanted something that they could schedule their pilots and schedule their maintenance. Um, so it was going to be easy, a six-month project. Um, so I was really looking forward to, uh, to handling it. So the two owners were there. Uh, I pitched my how I would do it. I was fully intended to do it all in access and, and all of that stuff. Um, and they liked what I, what I told them. So literally, I got up and walked away. And it was one of those, um, oh, by the way, moments, right? One of the two owners said, oh, by the way, whatever you make, it has to run on my Mac. At the time, we're talking about mid 90s, late 90s, Mac was inconsequential in the world. There was hardly any Macs around. And, and I said, that's not possible. 
I, I know of nothing that runs on both Windows and Mac. I just didn't. And, and so the guy said, well, no, there's this thing called FileMaker. Uh, go check it out. And I'm all like, holy crap. Um, I'm going to lose this, right? Because I can only deliver stuff on Windows. So I went to the store, picked up a copy of FileMaker. That was FileMaker 3, and that had just been released. Uh, there was a server 3. So, that, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll do this in FileMaker. I did it in FileMaker. I developed the whole thing about six months. Um, and then it had to be deployed. Uh, at the time, Windows was at NT4, so I installed an NT4. Uh, they didn't have any network. They had standalone computers, so we put in the network, all of that stuff. I was very proud that I put it all together. We fired up, and the thing was dog, dog slow. At the time, we had the choice of two network protocols. We had IPX, and we had TCP IP. TCP IP was fairly new, so nobody was really using it. Um, and I think out of the box, it came with IPX. So we had installed it on IPX. And that thing, while it worked great on my machine, when, when we put it on the network, it just didn't work. It took like five minutes to start up all of the, all of the usual stuff, right? Because I, clearly, I hadn't designed it with that stuff in mind. Um, and, and I was at risk of losing that job. They said, well, what have you been doing for the last six months, right? Look at this. I said, no, 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 no. on my machine, it works, right? Like all the classic excuses that we say, well, on my machine, it works, right? I don't care what it does on your machine. Um, so I learned very early on to pay attention to that stuff. I had to figure out what is IPX. I had no idea what IPX was. I don't know what TCP IP was, but I had to figure it out in a hurry because I would lose this client, which was my first big client. So I think that's why we should care. I'm not saying that we should be networking specialists or, or server specialists, but we should care enough that we know that our solutions live way beyond the development phase of what we do. All right. So when we look at a solution deployed on FileMaker server, or, or, or any server really, we have four traditional uh, bottlenecks, potential bottlenecks. And that's not FileMaker specific. That's the same for any solution deployed on any server anywhere. Um, we have disk I.O., right? How fast can, can we move stuff between the hard drives and, and, and where it needs to be? We have the processing power. We have networking. And we have the memory, right? So those are your four traditional bottlenecks and if you run into performance issues, um, it's going to show in one of those four areas. If we look at the FileMaker console, the FileMaker admin console for 17, um, it, it shows there too, right? At the bottom, and we have that little nice little graph there. But at the bottom, uh, we can choose, we can flip that graph between those. Um, there we go. Uh, between those potential bottlenecks, the, the, um, so we can see some information right there. Now, right off the bat, I, I don't want you to use that particular graph to draw any conclusions about if I, your solution is, is working, right? It, it's nice, but don't use it. Um, because it really doesn't show you what FileMaker Server is doing. It, it shows, well, by extension it does, but it shows numbers from the operating system, and it only goes back three minutes. Right? So it'll tell you what's going on right now, but that doesn't really tell you much because it doesn't tell you what happened an hour ago. When did it start? Can I, can I see a buildup or, or, of any sort on a relevant time frame? You're not going to get that from, from the FileMaker 17 um, console. So it's there, but don't really use it. The real information, the stuff that we should be paying attention to, is what FileMaker server can log, right? Right to a log file. Uh, because that is the information that can be collected over a long period of time. Uh, and that's what you need, right? Because you need to be able to look at trends. How, how did it develop? What's my normal, right? What's my baseline? If things go well, what do the numbers say? If things don't go well, how do the numbers change? That's what we want to see uh, in the log files. And log, log files will tell you. The stats log, top 12 stats, and client stats logs, none of the three are turned on by default. Right? Uh, if there's anything I would want to change in FileMaker Server, it's that, especially the stats log is an absolute must. Right? If you, if you go to your FileMaker Server, you set it up, enable the stats log right off the bat. Right? Because you don't want to wait until things go belly up to start logging. You want to log when things are normal so that you have something to compare against. Right? That's that baseline. You want to know what your normal is. Um, and I'll show you where to talk to the normal, uh, but that's the first thing. Top call stats log and client stats. Client stats has been around for a bit. Um, the top call stats log has been around for a couple of versions, uh, but it's a very interesting uh, log, and, and we can brainstorm about that a little bit um, 
when we... Yes, um, th those two, that's if I go back. Um, so the top call stats log and the client stats log, even if you turn them on, they will turn themselves back off every time that you re restart your FileMaker server or the, or the database engine, right? So, uh, uh, and, and they do that for a reason. They do that because the act of monitoring your server will use resources, right? It'll use processing power, a little bit of disk I.O. because it has to write. So the fact that you're monitoring will affect your numbers. Um, hopefully not too big, right? Because if that really brings down your server, it's probably a marginal server to begin with. Uh, but it's something to be aware of, that, that while you're monitoring and measuring things, you will be affecting what it is that you're measuring. This is a screenshot from the uh, Famica 13 admin console, which was the first one of that particular style, right? The one that was based on, on the same as WebDirect on, on Vadim. Um, so 13, all the way through 16, we've had this. Um, and with this, I mean, we had the bottom pane that gave us some numbers, current, uh, peak, and average low across a number of counters, the, the ones that we see on the, on the left-hand side there. And it gave you a live view. You can select a couple of those counters, and it will show you a live view of what was going on with, with those things, right? We don't have that anymore in 17. But in 13 to 16, we, uh, we had that. Um, and a lot of people are clamoring to have that back, and I can certainly see why. Um, with one big caveat, though, um, these, especially the bottom pane, useful. Again, not too useful, because it almost falls in the same category as what we have in the 17 uh, console. It'll tell you what your peak was, and that's fine. Really, what it tells you is you had a problem at some point. It doesn't really tell you how often did you have it, when did you have it, uh, is it a one-time fluke, or is, does it repeat itself enough that you have to pay attention? You won't get that from this, right? It's good because you can log into the console and you can see that something happened or you can see your current numbers and you can take action based on that. But from a real troubleshooting point of view or from a point of view of trying to figure out what you can change on your server in your solution, you're not gonna get that from this, right? Again, you'll get that from the logs. That's why the logs are so important. Uh, the live view is the same, right? Um, yes, you'll see it move, but you can't really go back and say, when did, when did this start? When can, can, I, can I map my normal versus my, my abnormal? Uh, you really can't do that from here. Um, personally, I would want it back too, just because it's easy, right? You can log into the console and it's there, um, but it's not the end all be all for troubleshooting and finding out if something is, is going on. Again, uh, I'll say it many times, but you'll get that from the logs. You won't get that from this. All right, so we have our four, tra four traditional bottlenecks, and we have our counters as we call them. The, uh, the little things on the left-hand side where it says, uh, can't even read it, uh, type, right? So the cache percentage and all of these things. So how do those relate to those four traditional and potential bottlenecks? When it comes to memory, we have the top two, right? The cache hit percentage and the cache unsafe percentage. Uh, those those are numbers that will tell you how much of what the clients request data-wise, uh, the data manipulations, can be served out of the database cache that you have configured on your FileMaker server. Right? So that's what, what that is about. Um, you want that number to be as high as possible. right? 100% is fine, because it means that everything that FileMaker server needs to do comes out of the cache. Uh, and that's where it needs to be. It should be above 95% on, on an ongoing basis. The ongoing basis, you're not getting that from, from this stats, right? Again, I have to go to the log to see over a longer period of time, how does that number look like? And this will dip when you do backups, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's not going to be 100% uh, flat line. Uh, it'll have dips when you do backups and that kind of stuff. But so when it comes to memory, those are your numbers that you can work with. To see how the disk could be a bottleneck, we have three counters. The first two are your raw numbers, like how much data is we being written and read from the disk in kilobytes. Um, so those are your raw numbers. Uh, that's kind of interesting to see. You can sort of relate it to what your solution is doing. Obviously, you have, if you have a solution that writes massive amount of data or stores lots of documents, those will be higher than if you have a solution where people just 
uh, look at data and, and write a lot of data uh, to your solution. The bottom one is the IO time per call, right? So, um, and those numbers can be high. Uh, one million of those translates to one second. Uh, so that's how you interpret those numbers. Um, the notion of call, uh, you'll see in some of the other counters as well, right? And that's where the disconnect begins between what we can get from Palmaker Server as information that we can do something about and how we translate that into what we know our solution does, right? Because we don't really know what a call is, right? A call is not the equivalent of running a script. When you run a script, it'll get broken down into any number of calls. We don't know, there's no good information to say, well, this script step is uh, four calls, or, or this script step is that, or the, the fact that FileMaker Server has to evaluate a particular calculation is one call or, or, or 10 calls. We don't really know. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, so you'll have to make a bit of a, um, I guess, a leap of faith or, or a leap of translation almost between what you know your solution does and, and how it shows up as number of calls um, in the stats that FileMaker Server gives us. For networking, we have two counters. It's a little slow catching up there. There we go. So we have two. Um, networking gives us the raw numbers, like how, how much kilobytes per second are coming in and out. And that's measured at the FileMaker server, right? Uh, and networking is one of those weird ones where um, FileMaker can measure what it receives and what it sends out. What it doesn't measure is how fast that happens, because a lot of that is outside of FileMaker service control, right? If you have low bandwidth, if you have a faulty switch somewhere on the network, those will affect how your users will perceive how performant or responsive your solution is. But that, that, that's really not something that FileMaker server can measure, right? It says, I'm receiving so much, I'm sending so much. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But we have the raw numbers, right? If you have complaints about network, that would be the first obvious thing to check. Like how much volume am I uh, sending out? How much am I receiving? And, and does it seem normal? Does it seem something that, that would potentially be a, an issue for you? And the fourth one is the processing power. Um, and we have a number of counters that, that are important there. The remote calls per second, right? Again, we don't quite know how our solution breaks it down into calls, but here we have a roll number, like how many calls does FileMaker Server receive per second that it has to process? Um, how many of those are in progress right now, right? Because um, that's what the server is currently doing. The other one is sort of like a volume-based, kind of like how, how busy does it typically get, but the, the in progress is what is it doing right now? And then we have two that have to do with, uh, with splitting it up by call, the elapsed time per call, and the wait time per call. The wait time is, is more like an aggregate of the elapsed time plus, uh, plus the wait time, uh, waiting for process to become available and, and uh, waiting for the disk uh, to do its thing as well, right? So uh, those do typically go in tandem, uh, but they can certainly deviate. But those are your numbers to look at when you, um, when you wanna see whether there's enough processing power to go around. In the old style console, um, we had a logging page, um, and that's where you would turn these things on, uh, and also set the logging interval, like uh, how, every how many seconds does FileMaker take a sample, so to speak, right? Um, the default is 30 seconds, uh, which is fine. You can still change it in 17, it's just not on the admin console anymore. Um, you can see where you turn on access log, where you, where you, the usage statistics, that's your regular stats log, that's the one the single most important log that you can have on the FileMaker server is the stats log. So that's where you turn it on 16. And again, none of these are turned on by default, right? So the very first thing you should do when you deploy FileMaker server, uh, turn on the access, turn on the usage stats, right? You don't have to turn on the bottom two. Um, those are typically turned on when you really need to troubleshoot something. You may want to turn it on for a little bit, to, again, to get a bit of a baseline. Uh, uh, but that's, uh, as Jeff said, um, when you do that, keep an eye on it, right? Because you don't want it to affect your server too much. But that's where you turn it on in 16 uh, all the way to 13. 
When you turn them on, FileMaker Server, inside the FileMaker Server folder structure, like where FileMaker Server is installed, uh, there's a logs subfolder. That's where the logs end. Uh, so that's where in 16 or before, that's where you have to go to and, and, and grab the logs from if you wanted it to. Um, the event log is there as well. Uh, event log is really useful for troubleshooting. Uh, but all the logs are there. This is also the folder that you should check if your server uh, is, is running into issues. If you have complaints about server being unresponsive, uh, users being disconnected, users not being connected. If I'll make a server run into any issues that it cannot handle, like any internal exceptions that it says, hey, hey uh, I don't know what to do with it, chances are it'll produce a dump file. The dump file will end up in this folder. So if you see any fo files in there that are uh, Timestamps, their file name will be a timestamp, and it has the .dmp extension. Those are dump files, and those are typically an indication that FileMaker Server hit something uh, that was pretty bad. It may be not bad enough to really bring down FileMaker Server in the sense that uh, FileMaker Server processes, of which there are multiple, may not have stopped. Right? You may not see something in the Windows log or, or the Mac OS logs, um, but if you see a dump file and it, the timestamp corresponds to reports of issues, performance slowdowns, stuff like that, uh, it's a good sign that FileMaker has a, a sort of like a mini, it had a moment, right? Um, so so uh, typically when you do that, it's time to reboot your FileMaker server. The dump files is also something you can send to FileMaker support um, if, you, uh, if you want to uh, um, escalate it up to support and, and uh, open a case for that. So uh, they may ask for those dump files. Now, if you look at the 17 admin console, we can't really turn on too much here when it comes to logging. The only thing we can turn on and off here is the top stats log. Um, the other logs, and you can download the logs there, some of the logs at least. You can download, for, download them from here, which is not something we, uh, we could do with the 16 admin console before, but we can with 17. Right? So that's it's kind of uh, interesting. Now, like I said, the, the, the regular stats log is the single most important log that you'll have. Uh, and, and, and I've said it a few times already, but turn it on. Right? As soon as you install a FileMaker server or you touch a FileMaker server, uh, a client's or one of your own, check, check to see that it's on. Uh, in 17, you can't really use the admin console for that. Uh, you can use the admin API. If you, um, uh, by now, if you or using a tool that the community has built or that you built your own to make admin API calls, you can certainly use that one, or you can use the admin command line, right? So the command for that is FMS admin enable uh, server stats. If you issue that, it'll enable the, the, the regular stats log, uh, the usage stats, and it'll, it, it'll, um, it'll persist, right? So it'll keep logging even after you restart your FileMaker server. You can enable the top call stats log from here and the client stats log from here as well. Uh, and just like I did before, it'll turn itself off those two when you restart your FileMaker server, right? So um, remember to turn them on from here. And, and the top call stats log, you, you can turn on from the, um, from the admin console. If you deploy on Windows, uh, you can take advantage of the Windows Perform. Right, that's a, a tool that is built into the Windows operating system. It's a great tool. Um, it's one of the main drivers for me, uh, all things being equal. If I had a choice between deploying on a Windows server or a Mac OS server, and there were no other considerations to make, I would, inst I would deploy it on a Windows server, and this is one of the main reasons why. Uh, the Perfmon on Windows is great. Um, it's been around since forever. You can find tons of resources if you're not familiar with it. Uh, you can open this from another machine, right? So you don't have to open it from the FileMaker server machine. You can connect to Perfmon from any other Windows machine. You can schedule it. Um, it's scriptable. And FileMaker server exposes those counters that we saw in the admin console that we just went through to break them uh, uh, across the, the potential bottlenecks. All of those counters are available in Perfmon. Going back way, way, way back, I think, Probably FileMaker Server 7, uh, at least 8 or 9, I I'm saying. Uh, so they've always been there in Perfmon. Um, and what it means is that you can now collate what FileMaker Server presents as its numbers, its performance numbers, with 
all the other stuff that that Windows exposes or, or that even the hardware exposes, right? So you can cast a really wide net and look at things at the same time as looking at the file maker performance numbers. Um, it, it's it's a it can even be triggered, right? It can be event driven. You can configure your performance to say if my elapsed time per goal per call goes over half a second, start logging because something is something is not right, right? So you don't have to be logging all the time, but you can you can create a set that you say, well, if this happens, start logging, right? And re start restart the log every day, uh, whatever you want to do. Um, you can, if you have a set of saved logs, you can load it into Perform and sort of like replay it, right? You can you can you can search, you can focus, you can narrow, you can broaden the um, the the time frame. It, it's a great tool to uh, to get familiar with. Go ahead. Uh, the, the question is, the, the, it's only what's in the stats log. It doesn't do the client stats. Yeah. When 17 was released, uh, Stephen Blackwell and I wrote a, um, a number of white papers on 17. Um, and as part of that, if you go to the family community, there's a page where you can download those white papers. One of them was on the new admin console, uh, where we basically said, well, this is what you can do with the command line, this is what you can do with the admin API, and this is what you can do with the console. And then we compared it against what you can do with 16. So for people familiar with the old admin console, it was a way to, uh, to find your way around the three new admin touch points that we have. Um, but we also had a section about monitoring. And we included, Three XML files. These XML files are complete perfmon sets that you can load, right? So you don't have to construct your own. You can just use those, load them into. Obviously, you'd have to be running Windows Server, um, but you can load them uh, and then see all the stuff that FileMaker Server does. Um, so we had a complete set for 16, a complete set for, a set for 17, um, and then we have one for 17 that just mimics what the stats log does, just the FileMaker stuff. The other two, what I call the complete sets, there's an, a FileMaker knowledge base article that uh, describes what FileMaker supports wants you to collect, right? If you make a call to FileMaker support and you're running a, a Windows server, they'll say, well, do Perfmon, and here's all the stuff that we would want you to collect so that they can help look at what's going on on your machine, right? So everything that's described in that knowledge base article is in those two complete sets. Right? So it's a little broader than just the FileMaker stats. Uh, it's the relevant stats um, that have to do with your disk I.O. In, in general, your, your uh, memory usage. So those four bottlenecks are included, or relevant sets of counters are included, but broader than just what FileMaker reports about them. It's what the operating system and the machine will report on them. So uh, uh, if you haven't checked them out, you can, uh, you can download them and play with them. Where is this document again? How do I find it? Uh, I can make a link available, but it's on the community somewhere. I'll uh, paste a link in chat perfect. right now. Yeah, and certainly if you're not familiar with, um, with Perfmon and you're getting your feed wet, just open a thread on, on the community and, and the people that know will happily uh, uh, get you going. On the Mac OS side, there aren't that many tools built into the operating system, right? We have our activity monitor. Um, if you, on the top right corner, if you filter on FMS, you'll get the processes that make FileMaker Server, right? So all of these, that's what FileMaker Server is. Um, and it'll show you some numbers. Um, the, 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 the tab, so to speak, right? Memory, uh, forget about energy, but disk and network. Again, those are those, the same four traditional bottlenecks that you will find for any deployment, right? So it'll give you some numbers on that. Um, not really great historical numbers, right? So it doesn't allow you to really to go back in time like the Perfmon would do if, if you had it uh, turned on or what the stats log will tell you. Uh, but it'll give you a good enough snapshot to, to uh, figure out if something is, is, is wrong right now. Um, you can do the same from the command line, right? With the Unix stop command. So OS is, Unix underpinnings gives you some tools from the command line that are pretty great at figuring th these things out. Um, but it, it requires you to be familiar with the, with the Unix and, and the command line. 
there's not a lot of um, great UI tools in Mac OS uh, built in. Now, if we look beyond what the operating system gives us, there are really good tools, uh, like Zabbix is one of them, uh, which is, uh, Zabbix is open source, uh, um, that allow you to do monitoring. Um, and especially if you have more than one server, right? That's when it really comes into play, where you can use one of those tools and aggregate uh, across your servers um, and really have it percolate up so that you have one UI where you can see all your servers and what's happening uh, in them. Uh, Zabbix and some of the other tools, they will hook into, if you have a Windows server, they will hook into those performance counters that FileMaker exposes to Perfmon. They will hook into what the operating system exposes. Um, they, they can tell you how much free you have. So it's basically a complete package of what is going on with your server. And that's really good news. These tools are built for notification. Right? So they can run things when something happens. right? So you can configure no end of events and triggers to say, if something happens, email me, text me. Right, uh, beat me if you still have a beeper. Um, they they can even take action, right? Because one of the things that I have in my Zabbix is um, the old style web publishing in engine. If you hit it really hard, um, it can go belly up once in a while, right? So, and the community has some really great ideas on on how to bring it back up right, when it happens. Uh, one of the easy ways that I found to do that is just is in my Zabbix I have a counter that looks at the thread count um, for the process, the, w, the web publishing engine process, right? Even if nothing is happening with my web publishing engine, if it's just sitting there listening for requests, there'll be some threads on that. If the thread count goes to zero, it means it crashed. And Zabbix can automatically run the FMS to admin start WPE, right? I, I don't, it's instantaneous. Well, it's not instantaneous. You have to configure how long it should wait for a thread to show up, right? So, and it could be as short as five seconds to say, if that thread count has been zero for five seconds, run this command, right? Um, so that's what these tools are built for, right? Um, these tools go over and beyond just monitoring and showing you what the numbers are. They are meant to manage uh, and, and uh, give you those tools. Like I said, this is open source. Um, there's a couple of other ones, uh, open source and for pay. If you work with an IT department, chances are that they are already using some of these tools, right? Um, so it's really good to strike up a conversation with them to say, what kind of monitoring tools are you using? And let's see if we can hook our FileMaker server deployments up with, uh, with what you have. Um, they'll love you for it because that's what they do, right? This is the stuff that makes their life easier. Uh, so instead of FileMaker being the up duck, up duck in, in any deployment or any environment, th this will help them embrace it because they say, hey, you, you play by our rules, right? You, you do the stuff that we expect you to do. Um, and it's not that, uh, not that hard to do um, because FileMaker gives us the tools to do that. All right, so we'll briefly do some of these bottlenecks and talk about FileMaker service specifically. Um, processing power. Process of power um, really comes down or breaks down in two big things, right? It's the availability of it, as in how much processing power do you have? And secondly, how fast is it, right? So we have the speed, the raw speed of how, how fast instructions that you give the processor can be executed. And there's how much room you have to execute things at the same time, right? So course versus speed. Um, this is an actual FileMaker server for one of my bigger clients, uh, 48 cores. Um, so the other highlight there is the clock speed. The other aspect is the, um, the number of, of cores that we have, right? So we have on this one, we have 24 cores with hybrid threading that is exposed to Windows as 48 cores. Cores versus speed. There's a real trade-off between the two. Um, the fewer cores on a processor, typically the faster the clock speed can go. And it's a heat thing, right? It's a heat and efficiency thing. Um, if you had 48 cores and at four gigahertz, that thing would melt, right? Um, so it has, to, it has to throttle down the clock speed typically. So there's a real trade-off that you have to make between choosing 
the number of cores, and how fast they are. Finding the proper balance for your Famica solution is a bit of a black art, right? It's a really interesting conversation to have, and we have it often on the community. Um, there's no hard and fast rules. It really depends on your solution. What is it that your solution does? How many users are using it? What are the users doing when they're hitting it? Those, kind, those are the kinds of questions that will determine whether you need more cores or whether you need faster cores. A big aspect of um, that decision is going to be the pure load, right? How many users do you have? Um, if you have five users, or if you have 50 users, 75 users, it's going to be a completely different ballgame, right? You'll need a different server. You cannot have a server. Well, you can if you buy a 48 uh, core server. It'll serve five users very well. Thank you very much. So 75 people at it. I'm not saying that it's not possible, right? It, it depends on what those 75 users are doing, right? Are they just browsing for data? Are they just reading data? Or all 75, are they running sub-summary reports across millions of records? Um, so those are the kinds of things that you need to look at, right, to, to scope your server for the, the task at hand. Um, so the pure load, right, the number of users is a big, big factor. Uh, the other thing is what kind of activity are you expecting to do server side, right? Uh, when I got going, when we had Famica Server 3, Famica Server 3, 4, 5 really was a database uh, server, right? It was a database backend. All it did was open our files, make it available so that we can get data to it and read data from it. That's, that was about it. Um, once we got schedules, once we got perform script on server, once we got web direct and other stuff that now happens on the server, if you have a fair amount of that, you have to find that your server now no longer is only a database server. It's now an application server, right? Different ballgame because it does different things. It, it requires different sets of resources to do that well, right? So and that's a big question in figuring out um, if your server is stable enough or if you're specking out a new server. Um, think about these things, like how much of, of the normal activity is going to be done uh, server side? Virtual servers are great for this kind of stuff, right? Um, if you have an actual metal server, uh, you got to buy what you have, right? You you got to figure it out ahead of time, and you say, I'm going to buy a eight core machine, right? I'll put an SSD in there. I'll put 32 megs of uh, gig of RAM in there, uh, and away I go. RAM usually is not a big issue. Uh, you can swap that out. Drives you can swap out. Processors. Yeah, it kind of depends on what kind of machine you buy. You can swap them out, or you can, you can buy one with a spare socket and put a, an extra processor in there. That's typically when it gets hairy, right? But um, virtual servers, you can reconfigure on the fly almost, right? You can assign more memory. You can assign more disk space. You can, you can assign more cores, or depending on how the virtual server um, environment is set up, you can even up the clock speed of the servers that are assigned, the virtual uh, processors that are assigned to you. Right? So virtual servers are a great tool in, in figuring this out and not having to, uh, um, let me rephrase that. They're, they're great for adjusting on the fly, right? So that you're not painted into a corner by the, the physical, the actual hardware that you, um, that you bought. Um, these are two old screenshots, and I have a new one with new Mac Mini. Um, uh, the question comes up on, on, the, on the community all the time, right? So, um, uh, for five users, what is a good server, right? And, and my response is invariably is that's an impossible question, right? Because the number of, of users is, a really, is only a proxy of what the server needs to do, right? Again, it depends on what those, what those, what those users will do. Um, it depends on how the solution is built. Uh, we'll get into that in, in a little bit. Um, and and I, I get the question. Um, but it's really dangerous to, uh, um, to simplify it to the extent where you say, well, yeah, Mac Mini will do. M maybe it won't, right? Because the old-style Mac Minis have, have dual cores, right? They're not easy to upgrade. Um, you buy what, you, what, what it is, and you're stuck with it. Uh, memory, yeah, drives, yeah. Processing, that, that's, that's what it is. Um, for the same amount of money, and again, I, I want to be a little careful, because for me, 
Operating system is a tool, right? I don't care. I, I use Mac OS, I use Linux, I use Windows. For, I'm totally agnostic when it comes to operating systems. For me, I, I'll, I'll pick the one. If I had a choice, I'll pick the one that serves my client the best. I totally get that for some people, it's a lifestyle choice. I, I like Audi more than Mercedes, but that's just me. Um, I totally get it, right? So if a client insists on a Mac, Mac it is. Right? So I probably will have a conversation about what it means, both in monetary terms and in scalability. Um, but I'm not going to insist that Windows because I like the Windows Perfmon and it gives me better tools, right? That's all things being equal, I'll go one way because it's at this moment in time, it has the best set of tools. And these things change, right? One operating system may be better today, it'll be not the best one tomorrow, right? Um, so I don't really, I want to caveat that. I don't really care about operating systems. I know pro Windows and anti Mac and that kind of stuff. Um, you, you get what you buy, right? So, and and um, Mac is a premium uh, brand, so um, that's totally fine. Uh, no issues with that. Um, at, this, at the time that you could buy this particular Mac Mini, you could buy a Dell that is a little more configurable um, for roughly the same amount of money. If we look at the new Mac Mini, right? So this one came out, what was it, last week, two weeks ago? Um, yeah, that, that's not inexpensive, right? This is the top model. Now, looking at the numbers, right? And again, I don't really care too much about the memory. 32 gigs is plenty uh, for most deployments, pretty much all deployments. Uh, well, I, I can't say that because if, if you have 100 web direct users, you may want to have more. Um, SSD is, is the norm these days. You have plenty of memory. I'm, I'm looking at the processing power, right? Um, that's a really good clock speed. Um, the, the upper limit, though, is your six core, right? Um, and you have to weigh that. You have to weigh that against what, what is my solution going to do? You'll have eight cores to play with. If you need more cores, the Mac Mini is not going to be for it for you, right? So you'll, you'll have to go and find another machine. Um, but the clock speed is really, really good. Um, the, when we're talking about cores and clock speed, right, and, and that trade-off, because the more cores, typically the clock speed goes down, meaning that your server will actually be slower executing things then if I had like the screenshot that I had uh, with the 48 cores, we we're talking about 2.4 gigahertz, right? Um, which is uh, a fraction of 3.2 uh, as the base speed, right? What it means that if I ask both of these servers to do the same thing as a single user, this one will, will be the panel of my 48 core machine, right? Hands down, and that's clock speed thing. Because uh, it, 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 it's just faster at executing things. Um, if I have 50 users doing something at the same time, I'm not sure that this one will hold up. My 48 core machine is going to hold up. Um, so the aggregates, um, when, when, when we talk about this trade-off between cores and speed, it's the aggregate, right? It's so like um, the better good for the most number of people. Uh, it's sort of like if you have 50 people to move and you have a choice between a Ferrari and a bus, right? Um, if you have two people to move, the Ferrari is going to beat the bus every single time. If you have 50 people to move, the aggregates of the Ferrari making all these round trips versus the bus making one trip, the bus is probably going to be faster, right? Now, if I put myself in the position of the first one to get a ride on the Ferrari, right, I'll, I'll be there really fast. I'll be there before the bus, right? But the last one to arrive with the Ferrari will happen after the bus, right? It's the aggregate thing. Um, Something that has a lower clock speed will be slower, but it'll hold up under load. And, and that's, that's the main thing, right? If you have enough load, um, you have to go on the more core side and sacrifice a little bit of the individual speed. Ideally, you want the most cores that are the fastest, right? So uh, that, that's where the, um, your, your sweet spot would be. All right, so that's an interesting machine for, um, for FileMaker Server. Uh, obviously, the, the class of the processor is not server class, right? It's not a Xeon uh, processor. Um, it's an i7, but uh, certainly something to consider. There was a question. Different classes of SSD storage for uh, server. What's that, sorry? Different classes of SSD storage. Absolutely. I, 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 we'll get to that. It's a really good point. There's, when, when, we, when we talk SSD, there's not a 
such a thing as an SSD, right? So there's different types of SSD. There's, there's workstation class SSD and there's server class SSD. And, and it makes a big difference, not just in, in pure speed, but also in, in lifetime, right? So mean, mean time between failure, that kind of thing. Things that are important for server, right? Servers need to be boring, need to be running all the time, uh, these kinds of things. Um, so we make the choices that we make with all of that in mind. Now, this is a quote from John Thatcher when he was still here. I've had many conversations with, uh, with John over the years about these things, like cores, uh, multi-threaded, uh, all the classic themes that come up all the time. Um, and I think this one summarizes, well, summarizes, it's a little long, but um, it, it's, it, it explains it really well, right? And I think the core message is that Thamic will try to use as many cores as it can whenever it can. That doesn't mean that it will use, if I have my 48 core machine, that doesn't mean that all these 48 cores will be used all the time. That's not what it says, it, but it'll try, right? It'll try. Um, there's plenty of design choices that we make or architect, architecture choices that just are what they are because of the nature of, of the solution that will prevent FileMaker Server from spreading the load equally on those 48 cores, right? Um, so we have to be realistic in our expectations um, if you have a solution that suffers from performance issues and you have an eight core machine, the problem may not go away if you go to a 16 core machine, right? Um, you cannot always throw hardware at, at the issue and expect it to go away. It'll depend on what it is that your, that your solution does. That, that one explains that particular uh, predicament really, really well. Data, yeah, that's a good question. What, when I when I say solution, it's um, yeah, it's all the files combined that make make up what it is that you're delivering to the business, right? Um, say you have an invoicing solution. Um, it can be one file. It can be twenty files, right? It doesn't really matter. That's the the choices that you make as to what you split on different files does have an effect on the performance, and, and we'll, we'll uh, mention that as well. But yes, it's, it can be one file, it can be multiple, but the solution is the overarching thing that delivers value to the business. All right, networking. Um, there's a couple of different things that affects how your users will, um, will experience your solution, right? Um, and obviously one of them is, is how fast the network is. Um, the two main factors, if we're thinking inside a, a, a local area network, right? inside a, a typical corporate network, Wi-Fi versus wired makes a big difference, right? Because Wi-Fi still today is a fraction of the speed that you'll get from, from wired uh, in, uh, Ethernet. So something to consider. Uh, Wi-Fi typically can be a little more spotty than wired, right? So uh, if you have users complaining about slow performance responses, um, that's so it's potentially something to look at. Clearly, if you're deploying across the internet, um, uh, between different locations, you have your WAN versus LAN, right? Uh, you may have gigabit speeds inside your building. Once you go outside, you typically won't. Right? Um, and that will affect the performance of your solution. Something to keep in mind. And FileMaker has made great strides over the years um, to change the way that they change between the various FileMaker clients and FileMaker server to make that as, as efficient as possible, right? So uh, when we got FileMaker Go, um, that kind of, FileMaker Go was a big driver in making that a lot more efficient, right? Because if you, if you consume your FileMaker solution on your, on your phone or your tablet, you want it to be responsive. And FileMaker really has, uh, has made the big changes there. There's other things that you need to be aware of that that may be happening on your network right like things like voice over ip video over ip um people watching youtube netflix prime video right so all of that stuff is going to affect the available bandwidth uh that you have on your network um and and not not only the because some of the things like telephony voice over ip those typically come with very ex aggressive quality of service settings uh, because nobody likes a dropped call when they're making a phone call and you're using voice over IP. So typically the network will be configured to give priority to those kinds of 
network activity, right? And it will push everything else down. And FileMaker Server will suffer from that because that's FileMaker in your network, right? FileMaker is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to networking, right? FileMaker is the way that FileMaker communicates with, between server and clients is very different than pretty much anything else that our clients will be using on the network, right? It's not the same as opening a browser and going to a web page. It's not the same as opening a Word document from a file share somewhere. It just is not, right? FileMaker client and FileMaker server communicate all the time. Because that's how FileMaker delivers some of the, its features, right? As, as a platform, um, it's one of the things that I saw when, when we were talking about the, the say, the, the FileMaker branding, right? The, the workplace innovation platform. Um, I really liked how they, or, or touting some of the features that we take for granted, like the instant propagation of data, right? The instant propagation of schema. If I go into layout mode and I move a button, all my users see it instantly, right? That instant propagation of what I do, same with data, right? So I, I use it to be looking at the screen, I make a change over there, and FileMaker, FileMaker Server takes care of communicating that to all its connecting clients. We don't have to write a single piece of code, of a line of code to make that happen. It's, it's one of the core features of the FileMaker platform, right? It's one of, one of the things that make it stand out the way it is. And to make that happen, FileMaker Server has to communicate with all of its clients all the time, right? It has to make sure that, they, that they're there, that it can talk to it. Even if we're not doing anything, even if we're just looking at the screen, our client will communicate with FileMaker Server, right? They'll, 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 there will be a heartbeat between the two uh, where FileMaker Server will check in and say, hey, are you still there? Um, so all of that together, uh, makes that FileMaker uses the network very, very differently than most anything else that we have on the network. Uh, and, and as FileMaker developers, we need to know that. Uh, when, when we talk to IT, when, when we troubleshoot these kinds of things, it's one of the core components of, our, of the platform that we, um, that we use, right? Um, and if something goes wrong, you'll see uh, these things in the event log, right? Where the communication was lost, uh, either FileMaker server was to keep in touch with a client and it found that it couldn't. Um, uh, and uh, and you'll see this connect. So that's the thing uh, to watch out for. Uh, you'll find that actually not in the stats log. Uh, this will be in the event log, uh, but those will be the events to uh, to be on the lookout for if you have networking issues, right? Uh, especially if you see these in batches, right? If you see a whole bunch of them at the same time, um, it's a sign that something is happening somewhere on the network that is dropping your traffic, right? That is preventing FileMaker server and FileMaker clients to, uh, to keep in touch with each other. Um, could be anything, right? And it could be, like I said in the beginning, it may not be happening on your FileMaker server, right? Yes, your FileMaker server can have a bad network card that does this, but it could be a bit of a bad wiring somewhere or a bad switch or something uh, downstream from FileMaker server or between FileMaker server and its clients. FileMaker 14, 15 have made changes in, in how resilient FileMaker is on the network, right? And how fast it starts up between sessions as well. Uh, so a fair bit has been happening there in the, in the last couple of versions uh, of FileMaker. Memory. Memory is almost never an issue, right? Unless you don't have enough. Um, <laughs> Um, but most, most machines that you buy these days, most servers, right? So it's rare to find a server with, say, less than 8 gigs of memory, right? 8, 16, 32. Uh, memory isn't that, that expensive. Um, it's a weird thing because many questions on the community, when people are describing their server and they have performance issues, they say, but I have so much memory, right? It's, it's almost never there, right? If you have issues, it's going to be in your processing power or it's going to be in your disk I.O. Right, so th those are the top two of those four that are typically going to affect you. Memory is probably going to be the last one on that list. Again, yes, if you buy an AWS micro instance with one gig of RAM, yeah, your FileMaker server is not going to run too well. Um, that's why we have minimum requirements, right? Um, once you stay within those, you're going to be fine. Again, with the caveat as how many, how many, how many things are you asking your FileMaker server to do, right? How many WebDirect sessions, PSOS sessions, uh, server-side schedules, these things will affect um, how much memory you will have. FileMaker Server has a database cache setting. Uh, this is the local console, that's where you adjust it. Um, you cannot adjust it anymore in Server 17. It's not in the admin console. It's not in the admin console anymore. You can still adjust it 
uh, from the command line and from the API, um, by default, server 17 uh, sets it at half a gig, right? 512 megabytes, um, which seems low. Um, but in my experience, the 800 that you see in the screenshots, that's typically how I configure my FileMaker servers. And I almost never have reason to up it. Almost never, even in really, really big and really, really busy deployments where we're talking about hundreds of users, right? And yes, you keep an eye on that, right? Uh, if this one is too low, the, that cache hit percentage and cache unsafe percentage that we talked about, you'll, you'll see it reflected there. Um, it's one thing very often you'll see misconfigured, right? Well, people will set this to five, six, seven gigs, 12 gigs, whatever, right? How much, uh, uh, really, really high, depending on how much RAM they have in their machine. Um, and it almost never serves a purpose. In fact, it can do the opposite, right? Because when you set this really, really high, what you're telling the operating system is you can't touch this. This is mine. FileMaker server sits on this. And it really sits on this, right? It grabs that number and sits on it, meaning that the operating system and anything that the operating system has to do cannot use it. Uh, so if you're not careful, you may be forcing the operating system to swap out what it otherwise would use in memory to the disk. Right? So you may be adversely affecting one of the two really potential uh, big bottlenecks, one of them being your disk I.O. by setting your RAM cache so high that it has an effect there, um, where the, the RAM cache will have probably no measurable effect on the performance of your solution. Right? So, so that's one to be careful about. Um, set it high enough so that you can get that consistent 100% when you look at the stats log uh, over a longer period of time. There's really no reason to set it higher. Obviously, like I said, watch out for how many schedules you have, how many uh, sessions you spawn on the server. Um, I, I have 256 uh, and direct up there. That's an old number. Uh, the number now is much, much lower. Um, but I, I didn't remove it, one, because I couldn't recall what the actual number was right now. Um, but also I had to serve as a warning, right? Um, WebDirect, Perform Script on Server, all of these things, but specifically WebDirect, it's an actual client session, right? We're back to that database server, application server kind of thing. Um, FileMaker Server has to do a full uh, client session for you when, when you have WebDirect, right? It, it'll require processing power, a slice of memory, and, and whatever disk activity that, that will generate, right? So, so keep that in mind when you spec your server and you have a, a good chunk of WebDirect users that you'll, uh, you'll throw at this. Disk I.O., like I said, this one is really important, right? So between that and the processing power, number one, number two, typically when we find performance issues, it's one or the other, right? Um, it's going to be one or the other. <clears throat> Old style Mac minis uh, have laptop uh, drives, right? They spin up at 5,400 uh, RPMs. Standard Dell server 7200, uh, still not really good, right? A good server, if you have spinning plates, um, should be around 15,000 RPMs, 10,000, 15,000 RPMs. Um, and obviously now, uh, de facto, you would almost invariably put an, an SSD in there, right? So um, when you do put an SSD in there, um, you'll see a price jump, uh, and the price jump is going to be in the, in, the, in the grade, right? Is it server grade? Is it uh, workstation grade? Um, so, so pay attention to that <clears throat> when, uh, when you choose. Uh, over the years, there's been a fair amount of confusion about RAID, right? What is RAID and what does it do for me? Um, if you do it well, it can have a performance impact, but the main thing about RAID is it's not about performance, right? It's about redundancy. I mean, that's, that's why it's called a redundant array of an expensive disk. It's not a speedy array of an expensive disk, right? It's not there to make your deployment faster. It's to make your deployment more stable so that if something fails, you'll have some redundancy and you don't lose your data, right? Um, IT departments like RAID 5. Um, and they like it because you get the biggest bang for the buck when it comes to the usable this space, right? So say that we have a RAID 5, in this case, we have four drives in this machine, right? Yeah, you have to pay for four drives. If you have RAID 5, it means that you can really use three of those four 
right? Um, because one of them can fail and you still haven't lost any data. Uh, and so with three out of those four, four you'll, you'll still be up and running. So you have the redundancy while maximizing the number of drives that you can actually use for, for, for its purpose, right? Um, however, um, when it comes to something that is disk intensive, like a database server, and not just FileMaker, like any database server, and other things like mail servers, right? Anything that, that uses drives a lot, um, RAID 1 plus 0 is the preferred uh, way to, to, uh, to go with RAID. Um, and th that's what it looks like, right? So you can see where A1 is, is listed twice. So you still have the same four drives, but now you only get the usable space for two of them, right? So when it comes to the amount of money that you spend on drives, you only get to use half of it. Um, but you get a better performance uh, rate when, when you do that, right? Um, so one of each has to survive uh, before you start losing data. Um, Typically, you'll see that when there is an IT department involved, right? When they when they set up RAID, so th this is a good conversation to have with them uh, about what levels and, and why you would potentially want to change it to something else. Um, so, having said all of that, um, if if you you get asked by a client or, or you look at the stats log uh, and, and you see that. You, have, you get really high elapsed time per calls, meaning that FileMaker is, is really struggling a little bit, is constrained in the processing power, um, or you see a lot of disk activity, uh, and it's really slowing things down. Um, you can look at the hardware, just like what we, what we talked about, right? You can see, am I on the right side of that core versus speed equation? Um, do I have fast enough disk I.O. Um, for what, to, what my solution is, uh, is requiring? Um, and, and you can tweak that, right? You can throw hardware at it. Um, you can put more memory in it. You can faster processors in it. Um, and it will it'll have an effect. But the single biggest effect that you'll have on performance is not going to come from, uh, from your hardware, right? It's going to come from your solution. Um, and we have great tools in our community that, that uh, will give you um, not so much performance information about your solution, but how your solution is built, right? If I if we inherit a solution, it's the first thing we do, right? We, we run a DDR, a database design report on it, and we will run it through one of these tools, Base Elements, Inspector Pro, FM Perception. And we'll look for these things, like how many sort of relationships are, are there? How many multi-predicate uh, relationships are there? Not saying that these are bad, right? But we want to get a, a feel for how many are there. Um, if you have a solution with 100 um, relationships, um, and they're all sorted, and they're all multi-predicates, that solution is going to be less performant than one that doesn't have them, right? So again, I want to be careful that I'm not branding these as bad. It's more, if you need to get a feel for a solution that you didn't develop yourself, these are the things that, that we look for, right? Layouts with many portals, layouts with many summary fields, uh, layouts that expose many unstored calculations. Summary fields and unstored calculations, as we know, um, will be triggered every time that that's that displayed, right? Um, and, and again, one of the big features of our platform is when something needs to happen, when something needs to be calculated, FileMaker Pro and FileMaker Server will do a little bit of negotiation to say, are you going to do it or am I going to do it, right? Um, so same thing may not necessarily always happen on the server or not necessarily always happen on the, on the workstation. It, it depends on what's involved, how busy things are. Does it require something that only exists in my session versus is it something that the server already knows about so the server can take care of it? So there's a bit of negotiation going on between client and server as to who does what when. Um, but clearly, if you have a summary, it's got to be calculated, right? If you have an install calc, it's got to be calculated when you show it. Um, so the question is, do you really need to show it there, right? Um, uh, sort of portals, right? Um, filter portals, same thing, because it, it happens or it can happen um, on the clients, depending on what and on how you do your end filtering, and it may be that FileMaker server needs to send you all the data uh, so that you can do the filtering and sorting on the on your clients. <laughs> Expensive execute SQL calls. Right? So I, um, a couple of DevCons ago, I showed the penalty for for having uh, either an expensive execute SQL or an execute SQL when you have an open records on the table that you're querying, which is a dramatic effect. 
Uh, if you haven't seen that, um, let me know and, and I can show you at some point. It's a dramatic effect, right? Um, so that's something to keep an eye for when, when you have a, uh, uh, when you have a performance issue. And this one is a really good example because the way, in a nutshell, for those who are not familiar, if I have an open record in a table and I do an execute, say it has a million records, because that was my, my example that I used. If I do an execute SQL and I have an uncommitted record in that table, FileMaker Server is going to send me the million records so that, Fam, that, that my client can do the execute SQL. The reasoning there is that FileMaker, say, FileMaker Server says you have uncommitted data. That is data the server does not know about because it hasn't been committed. It only exists in my session. And that's part of that negotiation between client and server where, where server will say, hey, you're asking for something that includes something from that table that I don't know about. You figure it out. Right? So it sends me a million records so that I can do the execute SQL. The way that that will show up is in really high numbers in that network kilobytes per, per, uh, in and out. Right? It, it's how we found that that would be the case, right? because we couldn't figure out where sometimes something would be sub, sub second, right? really, really fast. And sometimes it would take 10 seconds. So when we started doing these things and we kept an eye on that stats log, we, we saw the numbers show up and say, hey, that's interesting. Why? Is found like a server pushing a lot, a lot of stuff through the network when I do this execute SQL. So that, that's how you can do that kind of troubleshooting. Um, your execute SQL in general, I, I have a blog post about that, the good, the bad, and the ugly about execute SQL. I love execute SQL, but it has a very defined envelope, right? Um, if you go beyond it, it can be dog slow. If you stay within it, it's really fast, blazingly fast. Um, it's finding that sweet spot, right? So you may have to experiment a little bit. And, and when you experiment, keep an eye on your stats. That's what they're there for, right? They'll give you actual numbers uh, to help you figure out what, um, what to do and, and, and how to change uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the ratio, uh, when I look at a solution and I haven't built it, right? I, I, uh, I look at a table. And it, if the table has 400 fields, I'm going like, hmm. The next thing is, of those 400 fields in a table, how many of those are unstored calculations, right? How many of those are stored calculations? How many of those are summaries? Uh, that'll give me a feel for the nature of the design. Uh, and then that's something that I can say, well, we, we got to change this, right? Because it does not take 400 attributes to describe something, right? Um, and maybe we don't need these unstored calculations. Maybe we can do that as part of a scripted workflow where we, if you go from A to B, We'll calculate it when we need it instead of having it in the schema and then on the layouts where it'll be refreshed and recalculated when it doesn't need to. Uh, that's what I mean with wide tables, right? Uh, many, many fields in a, um, in a table is a bit of a, a red flag for complexity, efficiency, and design. And it's something that you probably would want to tackle uh, when, you get to, um, when you get to a certain point. And many solutions start out where they're totally fine, right? Um, you start with five, 10 users, and then the solution grows or the company grows, and hopefully the company grows by, by the use of the solution, right? By the efficiencies that you introduce. Um, and all of a sudden, you hit that cliff, right? Where the solution goes from good to be reasonably well to all of a sudden, yeah, no, right? It's, um, it falls off a cliff. Um, and many of these things would, would have contributed to, um, to that kind of thing, right? Um, I, I talk a lot, a lot of in, on the community on, on unsort calculations, right? So I personally would prefer where you do the calculation in a scripted workflow um, instead of an unsort calculation. I'm not saying that unsort calculations are bad, right? They're, they are not. Um, they're something that is very specific and typical for FileMaker. You don't necessarily find them in other environments, but they're a great tool. Stored calculations can have their own penalty, right? Stored calculations will be calculated when you do something with their dependencies, but also when you create a new record, right? Um, if you create a new record and you happen to be on a layout, say a blank layout, so there's no fields that need to be recalculated, none of the unstored calculations and summary calculations will fire, right? But your stored calculations will, because you create a new record, you commit it, and FileMaker will say, hey, you have calculations. You expect whatever it is to be stored, so I have to calculate it right now. Um, so they carry their own penalty, a potential penalty. You know? It's not a penalty all the time. The number of triggers on layouts, right? Um, triggers can really get in, in your way um, if you're not careful. 
so the I, again, I'm looking here for for, uh, for, for ratios, right? If I, I look for indicators as to what could make a, a solution not so performance, and having many triggers on layouts could be one of those. Uh, we come to what uh, what was discussed before, right? Single file, multiple files. It, it has an effect, uh, and it may not be in 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 what the users necessarily uh, will feel when when they work with your solution, but in the back end, on the deployment side. There's um, a, a big, potentially, there's a big uh, effect. The way that Thamic Server, for instance, does backups favors having multiple files versus one file. Uh, if you have a 10 file solution and you have a lot of static data, uh, data doesn't, that doesn't change from backup to backup, right? So data that changes maybe once a month when, when you calculate new sales summaries or whatever, right? Thamic Server, when it does backups, will only physically Occupy disk space, new disk space for a file that has changed since the last backup. If it finds a file that hasn't changed, it'll just heart link to what is technically called the inode of where it, it, the old file is on the on the heart uh, on the heart disk. So, one, it doesn't consume more disk space, and two, it doesn't waste time physically uh, doing a file system operation to to create a new copy of that file. So, your backups are going to be much more efficient, potentially. If you have a multi-file solution, so that, that's something to keep in mind when when it comes to architecture, right? That's uh, not something that the users will see uh, immediately. It's not not something that you will notice when you develop on your own machine as a developer. But in the deployed life of your solution, it may make an effort, right? If your file becomes huge, um, it make it make the difference between a single file, five minute backup, and a multiple file, thirty second backup. Right? That, that's the effect it can have. Uh, so it'll keep your, your users hostage less long when you do run your backups. Go ahead. What distinction are you making between a multi-table single file and a multi-multi-file? What distinction do I make between a multi-table single file and a, and a multi-file? Um, it's a good question. The, the efficiency that FileMaker Server Backups gives us, the way that I described, comes from the file level, right? So when I say, if when you have data that doesn't change too much, we're really talking about a table, right? So I, I would split that up in its own file or combine enough static tables in a, in a file where I know that they typically wouldn't change, right? The, the worst thing that can happen is that all your whole solution is in one gigantic 40 gig uh, uh, file, right? And all that the user has done since the last backup is change one field in one record. That's your absolute worst nightmare when it comes to backups. Because for FileMaker, that file has now changed. And it has to physically copy 40 gigs worth of data for the, for the new backup. Because you change one field in one record. Right. It doesn't really matter if you have a small solution, a couple of hundred megs, uh, something like that. But, but there's plenty of big solutions out there where you can really benefit performance-wise from splitting your file up into multiple files. Having said that, there's other things that, that you'll now have to consider, like security, right? And now you have accounts across the different files and, and all of that stuff. So um, it's not all roses when you do that, but it's a, a consideration that I think is worthwhile making. Did it answer that? Yeah, so for instance, if I had uh, all my images stored in a single table, if all my images were stored in a single file, and then I was just referencing that file, okay? Uh, or even if it was in some other kind of reference data, okay? Yeah. Zip codes, they don't change a lot, okay? And so I have a, a table that shows how much it was more than this one. Um, if, now, if that is a table within my single file, or if that is an external file that I'm linking to, what is the difference? There's really no, there's no difference from the, from the way that your solution will behave. For the users, there's going to be a big difference in the way that FileMaker make a server that, especially when it comes to backups. Yeah, I think that's my question. Yeah, yeah. Mark Mitchell asked, "Is it the same for progressive backups?" Yes. Yep, it's the same thing, and it's the same with with remote container data, right? So if you have lots of pictures, you probably would benefit from using them as remote containers because the remote container files, individual ones will get hard linked and all the benefits of that. Um, so to answer your question, I think, uh, if I have it correct, what I would do in this particular case, I would split that up. I would take those 
static table, the zip codes, and I would move it to its own file, right? From the way that you architect your solution, it doesn't really matter, right? Because in your main file on the graph, you put a table of occurrence to that other file, and yep, yep. So the, the way that you work with it inside, it doesn't really change. For FileMaker Server, when it comes time to backup, it'll say, hey, that zip code file hasn't changed since the last backup. I don't need to spend time or this space on it. Now, your backup set will still be complete. It's not like FileMaker will, if you go to your backup and you restore from that, it's not like you're, you'll be missing that zip code file. FileMaker is small enough with the hard linking to say, this is a complete set. Uh, even when you look at it through a Finder or a Windows Explorer, it'll look like a complete set because it is. It's really at a really low level of how the hard drive space is used that you'll get the benefit. Uh, and it could be, it could be significant, uh, the, uh, the benefit that you get from that. For example, like uh, if it's uh, an artist made in the system, uh, the console has an artist and uh, the information can come from PO, purchase order, inspection, receiving, and maintenance records, and inventory. So you've got that like, console with all this information. So you can view the, all this information in one file with different table. And you also can view PO as a different independent file instead of a table. So we we'll like to, uh, if it's one person to run it, one user, one user, or 50 users, we we'll like to make a big difference for this different application. Yeah, so the, the question is, uh, performance-wise, for the users, the fact that your solution is split in different files uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, you'll, there's no penalty for having or using a table that lives in, physically lives in another file in your solution. There's no penalty for that from a performance point of view. No worries. Uh, the other thing is is uh, multiple schedules at the same time. Obviously, right? Uh, if and this is where multiple cores comes into play, right? Because FileMaker Server is smart enough to say, hey, you're asking me to do extra activity. Uh, let's see if I can use another core for that. Now, it'll depend on what that schedule does, whether that core can be like really run with it, or it then has to wait on something else. That goes back to what I mentioned that John Thatcher had said, right? If, if it all comes down to writing, if everybody's writing to that same table, um, you, you're going to go into a queue at some point. Right? Then it doesn't really matter if you have 48 cores and, and the schedule runs on that core, if what it's asked to do then has to wait on, on something else because FileMakers, if everything goes to a funnel, then the funnel is going to be your, your, your pain points. So, so I have a question related to that. Um, we have like maybe 40 table imports that happen overnight and uh, we just we run them in sequence, but we consider if we're running them on server, well, maybe we could. Uh, we could run them in parallel with pull well, it to the number of cores we have at least with the ball laying at night eight or so. Um, would we have a benefit there or, or is it gonna be a bottleneck at the file level? No. So they're all going to the same file. Yeah. No, the, the question is if you have multiple imports and, and the imports go to their own tables, uh, you will have a definite benefit from running them at the same time. Even though it's going to the same file. Yeah, yeah. The file doesn't really matter, right? It's for FileMaker, it's really a lot of contention when it comes to contention that the funnel is going to be around indexing, right? Locking and in, in indexing. Uh, but if since since you're you're asking it to do activity in different tables, if there's indexes involved, they're going to be across different tables. It doesn't really matter, right? So one doesn't have to wait for the other. Yeah, the only place where that could be contentious is if you have like if if on import you're storing a bunch of calculations that hit all those other tables. So are you do, if you're doing any any data calculation and manipulation, like you've got auto enter calculations. Yep, exactly. what I should tell you. Yeah. Field dependencies, right? Yep. Yeah. That, that, that'll, uh, that'll do it. Yeah, uh, field dependencies, right? Uh, you change something here and it has to cascade down to a whole level of, uh, of dependent fields. Depending on how those are set up, stored, unstored, um, those are gonna have an effect. Um, because FileMaker will try to do its best to keep its data up to date at all times uh, so that it can propagate it to those users, right? So, uh, um, dependent relationships. Okay. 
do that again. Uh, there was a great. Um, I uh, gotta stop there. Um, and I think we have Vincent on, right? He just left. Oh, he just left. Um, there was a great thread on the community a couple of weeks ago. Actually, it spanned multiple months, I guess, at this point. Um, and Honza from uh, 2 for you in, in the Czech Republic, uh, he has a great product called FM Bench uh, to help troubleshoot and, and, and locate performance issues. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a great product. Um, and he spent a lot of time figuring this one out. Uh, Vincent, who, who, who was on the meeting a little while ago, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he had, uh, he had a, a question and uh, Honza tracked it down to, uh, to just that, right? Uh, there was one script that set a field, the act of setting a field to a value took up to 13 seconds, something like that, uh, just for setting it. And it was because there were so many relationships dependent on that one field um, that, uh, that FileMaker, you basically just by app setting that field, the way that we architected the solution, the way that we set up the graph and created our relationships, those have an impact, right? Uh, because FileMaker, like I said, FileMaker will try to keep all the information up to date. So we're changing something here. FileMaker knows this, have all these dependent things on it. So go off and do it. Um, so that, that's something to keep in mind when, when we uh, put our graph together, right? So, um, when we put our fields together and we reference other fields, all of these things. And, and again, like I said, um, I have this list here because that's what I'm looking for when I inherit a solution or somebody comes to us and say, my solution is slow, what can we do? I will run it through one of those an analysis tools and I'll be looking for these things. Again, not saying that these are bad necessarily, um, but there are signs of things that I can concentrate on, right? So, and obviously when, when you start fixing them and tweaking them, you, you look for the low-hanging fruit, right? If you have many complex layouts that show many summaries and answer calculations, the question becomes, the conversation becomes, from a business point of view, how do I not show this data, right? Do you need it here? Can we make it so that it's a multi-step process to get you through this thing instead of trying to show, show everything on one, one big screen, right? So, um, so that's, uh, that's what it is. Um, I want to jump a little bit into the data API, IoT kind of thing. Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, we have technically we have until four, but we can go a few minutes longer if people are good with it. Yep. But if not, we'll take it. Yep. Uh, it's not four thirty. And after the whole Well, I have another meeting at four thirty, uh, so okay. four. <laughs> so okay. yeah. Yep. Um, for those who were in my demo session, uh, one of my two, I spoke on the admin console and the admin API, uh, and I also talked about um, IoT, right, um, and the data API. Um, and one of the core messages that I wanted to deliver was that whole thing, machine learning, data science, artificial intelligence, internet of things, it's a lot closer than it has ever been. And I don't mean closer in time. It's not like, oh, like next year or two years, it's here right now. Um, and, and this is this is Amazon, what they offer when it comes to web services uh, for internet of things. This is what they have for machine learning. And I use the... Um, Poly, Amazon Poly in my, uh, in my session. session. Um, when I say it's closer than you think, I mean it's closer within our reach as Samic developers to use these things and make our solutions better, right? Um, these things solve problems that are really complex that we prob probably wouldn't even begin to, to solve on our own if we had to, uh, right? So data analysis. Most of our solutions sit on a wealth of data that the users don't really use, but that they could use, right? Uh, you were talking about the purchase order, uh, invoicing solution, that's a classic solution that we solve, right? Um, um, if they wanna know, um, what's the best time to sell widget A? Uh, and if you run it through uh, machine learning or data science, it may say um, your, best sell, your best chance to sell this to people in Massachusetts is when it rains on a Tuesday. Right, it's it's the kind of questions that you can ask your data that these things solve. Uh, that we uh, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. These most of these things are exposed as web services, right? FileMaker since sixteen, like I said in the beginning, to the um, insert from URL with the curl options and the data API to get data back. Um, they, they make these things so much easier. Right? It's not that hard to get into them because all of the big players are in there: Microsoft Azure IoT Hub. Um, AWS has a lot of IoT, uh, Google Cloud has a lot of IoT and, and, and all of these web services. 
there's great stuff that we can do. We're, we're talking about images, right? And my, my wife is a photographer. She has tens of thousands of pictures. Um, it's painstaking for her to, to classify all these pictures, to say, oh, this is a picture of a dolphin. This is a picture of a sunset, right? You can run all of them through Amazon, right? They have recognition. Uh, you send the picture, they'll, they'll send you back a list of tags to say there's grass in there, there's a bike in there. That's the kind of stuff that we can use immediately uh, with, with our solutions. Uh, Parvigal is a big one. Uh, I'll be talking about that uh, actually tomorrow. Um, in my DEFCON session, I used um, uh, a couple of these, right? That's a Raspberry Pi. Um, runs Linux if you want it to run Windows 10, uh, IoT version. Um, I was using a hat to collect sensor data. Uh, this one and this one. This is a Grove hat. You can pretty much plug any kind of sensors in there. This, this, is, this is Lego for geeks. Um, you, you, these sensors cost like five bucks each, right? A Raspberry Pi uh, costs 35 bucks. Um, a hat like that costs maybe 10, 15 bucks, right? You, you can, there's no end of things you can do with that. And, and you can, you, all of my source code for my DEF CON session is on GitHub, so you can download it, uh, play with it. Um, I've got some Windows code in there, some Python code in there. Um, I was using that during ETS for FileMaker 16 and 17. Um, I had two of those Raspberry Pis like this hitting my FileMaker server that was on Amazon uh, three times every second for six months straight. That thing was rock solid. Uh, I generated something like uh, 8 million records over that time. Um, it's, the data API is, is a thing of beauty. Um, I did this too uh, in my DEF CON session, uh, Billy Pass on the left-hand side. Um, on the right-hand side in FileMaker, um, I have a, a little file. You can type anything in there, right? So just type some text in there. Um, I hit Amazon Poly. Amazon Poly is a text-to-speech. Right, uh, you send the text, it sends you back an MP3 uh, with a spoken whatever it is, any language you want, any voice you want. Um, over on the, on the left, left hand side, I had this Raspberry Pi here, um, uh, checking through the data API, it was checking my solution. If I flag a record on the right hand side, my, uh, my uh, Raspberry Pi through the data API would pick it up, would say, hey, you got something to play? Um, it would download the MP3 with some other data, and then Billy Bass would uh, would play it for me. Um, and if you hadn't seen it, and the sound is really good from uh, from this stuff. But uh, but that that's what it was, right? Uh, and what I wanted to show you. Uh, for those who've been around a long, long time, Billy Bass was at DEF CON almost 20 years ago, so I thought it was time to bring him back. Um, but I think what it really demonstrates is that very inexpensive devices like this, right, um, can read your read data from your FileMaker solution and, and manipulate the environment, right? So this one has a motor hat you can connect, because that's how I drove this, right? The left-hand side, you see my Raspberry Pi. The fish has a couple of motors for the mouth, for the tail, for the, for the body. Um, so I can, I can make it do things. I can manipulate environments from my FileMaker solution. Uh, and the project that I'm working on right now does that in, in a big way, in a big, big way. Um, Uh, this, this is the unit that, um, uh, the, the, the problem that we're trying to solve here is um, this is a client that monitors fuel tanks for its customers, right? Um, and um, when it's time, say, when, when it's going to freeze at night, they, there are certain additives that they need to add. Uh, if the temperature goes above a certain number of degrees, they have to add some additives. When fuel is delivered, they have to take a sample. Um, so all of these things is what, or the services that he provides for his clients. Um, what he wants to do is he wants to automate some of that stuff. And this guy knows his business really, really well. And he knows just a little bit about FileMaker, enough to run his business, right? So all of his sites, and he has hundreds of, of sites where they have a fuel tank. Uh, he managed that in FileMaker. It's integrated with the, the weather services so that he knows ahead of time, he does the seven day forecast. So he knows what sites will be hit with rain, with, uh, with freezing temperatures. So he can, 
proactively do his stuff. Now he wants to take it to the next level. He says, what if we install a device on every site um, that, that will, um, will take instruction from me, right? I'll, I'll be doing something in my family solution and I'm saying, do that in Dallas, right? Or do that in Alaska. Um, so what we're looking at here, that thing in the middle, that little white thing in the middle is about the size of your thumb. That's a particle electron. It's a cellular device um, that, um, that will be in communication with the data API. Um, all the rest is basically there's a, a couple of relays. Uh, there's an analog to digital and digital to analog so that we can drive motors and valves and pumps and that kind of stuff. So that when, when we put it all together in its casing, that's what it looks like, right? That black thing on the right is, is the unit and all the rest are pumps and, um, and, and other things that, uh, that will drive the, um, the additive. So the, the, thing in, oops, the thing in the center, that's the units that will have the device and the pumps and, and all of that stuff. Um, but that's, that's how it works, right? So we have our FileMaker solution, we create the programs, uh, but in essence, that's how it works. Exactly like my Billy Bass, right? I use Billy Bass as an example because it's, it's fun and, and people can relate to it, but it's exactly the same thing, right? I have my electron on the, on the left, um, will con commun communicate to my data API to say something new for me, something I need to do. Uh, the electron has firmware, right? So it can, it can operate totally independent. If I feed it a new program to say, you know what, when there's a fuel delivery, do something else than what I told you. Our program, because all these parameters for the program were defined in FileMaker. We package them up as JSON, and from in FileMaker, we, we basically upload it to the electrons to say, all the sites or these sites, here's a new firmware for you, right? Here's a new set of instructions. Some there, they can operate independently. If they co power out, if they power up, they don't need to communicate with me because they already have my, my settings, but they will check in once a day to say, you got something new for me? Or I can push it, right? From inside phone, I can tell it, update yourself because I have new stuff that, uh, that you need to pay, pay attention to. Um, and particle, uh, that little star thing, that's particle uh, as a hub, uh, that's why we chose Particle for this one, because it's an integrated uh, uh, environment. They make the hardware, like the Electron, uh, that, that sits at the core of it. Um, they, they take care of the connectivity. So they have a data plan, they sell you the chip, they have a data plan that does it, and they have their own hub, right? So, um, oops. So that thing on the, on the bottom left, uh, that sort of information that the electron phones home uh, to to particle with a bunch of in information, right? So I can expose functions and variables, uh, and they all communicate up to the particle hub. And from inside FileMaker, I can talk to the particle hub through their APIs. It's, it's a straightforward API like anything you you, you can find, right? So uh, FileMaker talks to the particle hub. The hub talks to uh, the electron. Electron talks to the particle hub, sends it the information about uh, how it's doing, like its vitals that I can read from, um, from inside FileMaker. But I can also, from my electron, I can totally bypass that particle hub, right? From my electron, I can talk straight to the data API if I need to, right? If the particle hub for some reason is down, I don't need to depend on that. I can talk to my FileMaker server directly. Um, so that's the kind of IoT solutions that I, when I say it's closer than you think, it really is. Because this client knows his business and that's all that is required, right? Because it doesn't take it doesn't take too big of an effort to put this together in FileMaker. Yes, there's a little bit of hardware involved and that kind of stuff, but Particle, like most APIs, they document what it is that you can do. Um, and then in FileMaker, with the help of the community, uh, we can help you consume those APIs and figure out how to talk to them because all of that is relatively straightforward. Um, and that's what I have for you. Uh, any more questions that came up that uh, made the title? There are a few really cool. <laughs> is that? Someone just said, Mark Mitchell just said, really cool. Right. Uh, let's see, it's going back to that. Uh, oh, Rosemary answered that one, I guess. Uh, somebody asked about, did, did you use Octane drives? Octane drives? No, doesn't ring a bell. I may have to repeat my question. Sure. No, the, the question was, uh, have I used Octane drives? Um, not that I recall. Um, Questions 
here. Any questions from uh, from you guys? Yeah. <clears throat> So the, the, the comment was about the hardware controller for, for a RAID and issues with encryption if you don't. Um, and that's a really good point. I probably should have emphasized that a little better. Um, if RAID is going to be used, um, it, it, it needs to be used because of the redundancy factor. And if you do it well, you can really speed up your, your, your solution in the process, provided that you get good enough hardware. right? And I would never do RAID without a really, really good hardware controller for the RAID. Um, there are software raids as well. I, I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't. Um, it's it's. Uh, I, I don't want to talk in absolutes uh, um, because that that's too dogmatic. But uh, uh, it's it, that would be a red flag. I, I think raid requires a really good hardware control of the raid. Absolutely. Can you use uh, uh, FTP to server that hosted in uh, AWS cloud? Uh, FM perception? Yeah, that kind of thing. Sir. Okay, so the, the yeah, yeah. The, the question is, can I use FM perception or one of the analysis tools on, on a hosted solution? Uh, the way that those tools work is that um, you uh, you open your solution uh, with full access because that's what you'll need, and from the advanced tools you run a database design report, which basically spits out a big chunk of XML that describes your solution. And that's what you load in the, in the analysis tools, right? So you, you don't really touch your file necessarily as hosted, but you ask the, the file for a report, which is XML. Uh, and that's what, what you use in the analysis tools. All good. All right. I thank you for your time. If you have any questions, uh, find me on the forum, send me an email. Uh, I have a couple of business cards if you want one. Um, yeah, always, always here, always happy to help and uh, talk about these things. Thanks. Thanks.